Okay, so today I will present exercise as a smart tool to decrease further in pediatric cancer. Um, and I'm the peer program coordinator at the Kids Cancer Care Foundation here in Calgary, Alberta. And I'm also an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Calgary. Uh -huh. Okay, so the idea today is uh, go through common side effects of cancer treatment and exercise benefit. We're going to talk a little bit about what kind of exercise guideline we have in pediatric oncology, the peer program that is a community-based exercise program that I coordinate here in Calgary. Uh, I also want to give you some tips in the peer website and then we're going to open to questions, but as I said before, feel free to ask questions along the way. Okay, before starting, I just want to make a definition about what physical activity is and what the difference with exercise. So as you can see here, physical activity is defined as any bodily movement produced by the skeletal muscles that result in substantial increase of energy expenditure over resting level. So whatever you do, if you go for a walk, if you are dancing, if you are doing gardening, laundry, whatever, make you move around, that is considered physical activity. Exercise is a kind of physical activity that is performed uh, in a repeat basis and that have like a, an objective over an extended period of time. Usually the objective is in terms of maintain or improve your fitness or health conditions. So trying to improve your aerobic condition, your muscle strength or your flexibility. So we know uh, that today, nowadays, we have so many different treatments to cure cancer. Uh, those are different and all of them have different also side effects. Um, the good thing is like the, the, those late effects in the kids uh, are promoting different parts of their body. They might become as a heart damage, delay puberty or sex difference, nerve damage, secondary cancers, different grow, growing problems, osteoporosis. But the good thing about that is we realize, and we've been doing like so many uh, research, and a physician started to um, accommodate treatment to try to decrease those side effects. So in nowadays, it's not just important to survive cancer, it's also important to survive with a good quality of life. So we know that all the treatment that are made right now are trying to decrease the burden or side effect. Um, and we also know that exercise is an excellent tool to try to decrease those side effects. Um, and also the late effect that come with years after treatment. So we can see here in this graphic, in 1960, the cure was really low. We have like a, just 28% of kids survive pediatric cancer, compared to nowadays that we have like almost 90% of kids with cancer surviving five or more years. It's a huge difference, a huge improvement from a medical perspective. It still is a lot to do because we don't want any of the, our kids dying with cancer. Uh, but the positive side effect is like in the 90s, 80s, the physician started to realize that the kids survive longer. So they started to care about what kind of side effect those kids develop. And they started to try to decrease the toxicity of treatment and try to find better options but also started to um, increase the attention around psychosocial team to increase the quality of life and psychosocial of the kids and their families. In 1990, I we realized that we have the first publication about cancer and exercise. And it was not about any intervention. They just started to measure that kids that receive chemotherapy and radiotherapy have like a low um, aerobic capacity and low strength compared with healthy kids or their siblings. Um, so they started to realize that maybe there is something to do with exercise to improve their quality of life. Um, and today, because we have like a very high cure rate, 
the physician started to focus more in the increase the quality of life and decrease toxicity, as I said before, and exercise started to become a very important area to explore. If you see here, in 2011, uh, was published a review about exercise intervention in children with cancer. I don't know if you are familiarized with the review, but basically a review is kind of a publication that summarize all the other publications that are uh, in that area, in that field. So basically in 2011, this article, this review article, did like a compilation of just 15 studies. A few years later in 2019, same authors, one of the same authors uh, that work actually in the St. Jude's Children's Hospital, published another review but this time we have 36 studies compiling evidence about the benefit of exercise in pediatric oncology. So we learned with all these interventions along the way, we learned that cancer and its treatment promote a decrease in muscle mass and the strength, uh, usually promoted by the use of corticosteroids and also like some chemotherapy agent. We also know that um, chemotherapy and or radiotherapy affect pulmonary and cardiac capacity, decrease the immune system, also promote psychosocial disorders like depression, anxiety, isolation, sleep problems. Um, we also know that a long-term use of corticosteroid and metrotexate might promote osteoporosis, a decrease in the density of the bones. Peripheral neuropathy is another huge issue, especially in kids that receive high dose of vincristine and fatigue for sure. At some point in cancer treatment, the kids experience some fatigue issues and that fatigue might even uh, persist after the treatment are done. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. So what we realize is that physical activity can counteract all those side effects and can improve the muscle mass, pulmonary and cardiac capacity, immune system, psychosocial disorders, osteoporosis, peripheral neuropathy, and fatigue. So something so easy to do without any cause, without any side effect, can promote huge benefit. And these uh, benefits were compiled in more than nine reviews performed in this area. So sometimes we, uh, as a parent, uh, even as a kinesiologist, we have so many questions about how much exercise is okay for our kid, what kind of exercise they are okay to do, what happens if they are immunocompromised, what happens with their port or the central devices. So I've been doing, as part of my uh, PhD in Spain, I did an intervention uh, in kids that were and their bone marrow transplant and basically was the first time uh, that we did an exercise intervention in kids under bone marrow transplant. Until that point basically exercise was contraindicated. Uh, there were a lot of like um, people were so afraid of what happened, my kid is so immunocompromised, they also are anemic, they don't have platelet levels, the risk might be huge, let me tell you that we did that intervention in Spain and it was really, really successful. I still remember going into the room with the kids and at that point just one person was allowed to be in the room with the kids, so parents need to leave the room once I got there. But they were so scared that in the room they have a huge window and they say, okay, see you in a bit. And they went outside and they sit in the front of the window like this see what she's gonna do with my kid and i enter into the room uh, i have like all my equipment sterilized i have like my gloves my everything my protective equipment and i started moving the bed to one side and i started to move the chair so then i have place to move with the kids and we were playing there a lot of things we were playing basketball we were playing tennis and they have like the little stick going around with the bags with the chemo sometimes um, and was a really successful intervention. We realized that exercise, contrary of what was uh, thinking before, 
was really good for the kid. I have uh, so many testimonies for the parent uh, that said that they don't care what we were studying, the kid was so much happier and they were able to walk outside of the room instead of going in a wheelchair. So it was a huge difference and the kids were able to maintain their strength, their strength level and also their body capacity. And we didn't find any side effect. The immune system recovery was the same uh, time. Uh, but this was also like a small, uh, tiny uh, group. But then in Germany, they expand kind of a similar study and they confirm what we were found there. We also did another intervention in Spain, uh, the same with kids in bone marrow transplant. And we did kind of a combination of active video games. You can see the kids playing the Wii stuff at that point. Um, and we did like an active video game intervention at home that they performed by themselves with their families two days a week. And then they came to the hospital and we performed another intervention. The intervention was performed just after the first 30 days of treatment. And we realized that exercise has also an impact in the immune system. So what happened is the kids that exercise at that point increased the natural killer cells that are the first kind of cells that recover after transplant much faster than the kids that were sedentary. But also those kids were not just much faster, they were like more powerful against cancer cells. So we test kind of the cytotoxicity of those cells and those cells were more powerful. And again, this was such a tiny study, it was kind of the first study that studied um, immune system recovery in that population, but the preliminary data were really good. And now there are more studies undergoing to try to assess that, uh, that benefit. We also realized, as I said before, that exercise can improve strength and quality of life. We perform also like an intervention in kids with leukemia. They were before four and seven years old. And they were like all in main and phase of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And the same with just 12 weeks of intervention, the kids were able to improve between 20 and 50% their strength. Um, I remember that the same it was really a novel area that we started to to research in that time in Spain and we have all the media coming to the hospital to see what we were doing and also like interview the kids and the thing that I remember the most in that intervention is one kid Alex he was seven years old at that time and when the the, the interviewer asked him what was the best part to come into the exercise program every morning they say, he, he saw, he say at that point, he's like, now I can play with my sister without getting tired. So that is a huge thing. And it's kind of let us think about that. Sometimes we are like very cautious and very overprotective. And sometimes, you know, our kids are tired and they feel bad, they have nauseas, they are fatigued, they have aches and pains and they don't want to move. Uh, so sometimes we just encourage them to rest and we have to try to do the opposite because we know that if they move, they're going to recover faster, their muscle strength, their aerobic capacity, and they're going to feel better and they're going to have more stamina. Um, this is kind of the same study that we did before and we also realized that they were able to improve the aerobic capacity. So basically, when we test the kids, we are gonna see here a few videos where we see the kids doing like what is called VO2 max, maximum aerobic capacity test. And they basically just walk in a treadmill. Um, they were so little, so we have a lot of people around just to be sure nothing happened to them and they don't fall. And we assess how much oxygen they were able to process. Uh, and we realized that they have a maximal oxygen consumption of 24 milliliters. So basically, just for you to have an idea, 24 milliliters oxygen was the maximal capacity that they have. A healthy kid should have around 45, kind of double of that. 
So when you have like a little capacity, little aerobic capacity, that make you feel very tired and very fatigued, and you might become exhausted trying to play a basketball game because you need 24 milliliters to play a basketball game. So basically you're gonna be at your maximal capacity trying to play that game. You also need almost 20 milliliters of oxygen to go up the stairs. So that is the reason that our kids doesn't want to go up the stairs because they're so tired. Their aerobic capacity is affected by all the chemotherapy and radiotherapy and also by the sedentary behavior that they develop being in the hospital for a long period of time. So what we realized is after 16 weeks, they were able to increase almost seven milliliters. So from 24, they increased until 30 in just 12 weeks. So we realized that their aerobic capacity is affected, but this damage can be reversible by exercise and trying to motivate them to move and increase their stamina. Here we have, as I say before, in that intervention, we realize that kids with leukemia and other type of cancer usually develop atrophy and myopathies. And usually it's because of the long term of the corticosteroid and sedentary behavior. And we realize that doing like an exercise training three times a week, they were able to improve that strength from the 20 to 50%. So in Spain, we were very lucky. Uh, was, that was so funny because we have all pediatric machines that were donated at that time. So I remember, I still remember all the kids coming into the gym, uh, first day of training, and they were all happy to see all the machines that they all wanted to try and all the bikes. So that lasts for a week. After a week, they were so bored to do exercise in the machines that we have to convince them that if they did the exercise in the machine, we can play other game. So this was a research project, but now we learn in everything and we realize that the key factor to do exercise with kids is the fun factor. We really need to adapt the exercise to the needs and the likes and dislikes of the kids. If we try to force the kids to do exercise that they don't like, they're gonna do it for a few weeks or they're gonna do it because we kind of compensate them after and say, okay, if you do this, then we can do that. But really what we want uh, from a long-term perspective is create the behavior of an active lifestyle. To create a behavior of an active lifestyle, we really need to try to offer a kind of exercise that they're gonna enjoy and they're gonna like and they want to come back to do the same. So for that reason, now we translate all what we learn from the research community to a community program. And now we are trying to expose the kids to as many activities as we can and offer them the opportunity to try and to know new activities until they find what they like the most. But from a research perspective, sometimes we cannot be flexible because if we are flexible, we cannot really prove what we are trying to prove. Um, so that kind of difference between community programs and research programs, and both are equally important and we both, we need both. Um, here we have Karen. Karen was four years old at that time. And she was, oh, she was doing like a test to see uh, the, muscle, the muscle mass of the chest. And as I said before, she improved 50% in 12 weeks. Any questions so far? No? Okay. So another thing that we see from the research environment is peripheral neuropathy. Um, as you might be familiarized with peripheral neuropathy, is kind of a neurotoxicity, a side effect from one of the chemotherapy agents called vincristine, most commonly. Um, so basically what happened is vincristine uh, is accumulate and develop toxicity. 
that manifest in different ways. Uh, one of the ways is uh, decrease the intestine motility and increase constipation. And another common side effect of the, this neurotoxicity is the developing of peripheral neuropathy that basically is the damage of the nerve that are clogs, so the hands and the feet. Um, the symptoms of peripheral neuropathy uh, start like as a sensation stuff from like numbness, tingling, pain, loss of proprioception, and sometimes the deep reflexes, the Keeler's tendon and the patellar tendon are affected. And then if become more serious, also affect motor development and distal muscle weakness. Usually the extensors, the muscle extensor of the hands and extensor of the plantar dorsiflexors are the most that are more affected. So what we started to see is like our kids having difficulties to go up the stair, having difficulties to do squats. Um, we started to see something that is very common is walking on the tiptoes. Uh, because the range, the, the dorsiflexion range of motion in the ankle decrease and that doesn't allow them to do all these moves. Um, so unfortunately, um, kids try to adapt as fast as they can. So they generate a lot of compensation movement. And at the end of the day, uh, what started with an increase in the range of motion in the ankle dorsiflexion room, also translate in gait problem and ataxia. Also in the hands, they might have a lot of problem with fine motor skill, grating, buttons. So just a question here. Question. Um, so does that affect one side more than the Usually, other? Usually uh, the question here is if affect more one side than the other. Usually the affection is bilateral, but my change. And that might be also for all the compensation modes that the kid might develop to keep going with their life. But they usually affect both eyes. Um, yeah, so peripheral neuropathy is one of the main things, main side effects that we also see. And we know that exercise can increase uh, the recovery. We also know that once, um, what happened is the cum cumulative doses of being Christine increase the chances to develop peripheral neuropathy and increase the um, uh, grade of affection. Once we stop the being Christine, all, most of the side effect might resolve, but we also know that sometimes there are some uh, side effect that might, lost, might last for years or might be permanent and irreversible. But most of the time, what we see is like when we stop the, uh, the being Christine administration, the peripheral neuropathy improve and the neural and the nerves try to recover their normal function. Um, one of the things that happens sometimes in the hands is like sometimes because the extensor of the hands are the most affected muscle mass. Sometimes they become very weak and the flexor make the finger to just bend. And the kids are not able to extend it anymore. So what we usually see in those cases is physicians try to uh, put like, um, I heard it says oh, now, ah! I can't remember the, the name now. Well, put like kind of a, a cast, thanks so much, <laughs> to try to uh, extend the finger and maintain the normal position because after they stop the being Christine, the nerve might be able to recover the normal function. But sometimes if that finger stay like flex all the time, they might become deformed because of the position that was hold for a so long time. Um, yes, the other thing that we can see also from an exercise perspective is like working the plantar dorsiflexion muscles and extensor. So that may help a lot to decrease the uh, affection of peripheral neuropathy. Try to promote also like stretches of the gastrocemius muscle group are also going to help. Uh, let me see what happened here. I can, um, okay, here. 
So we know that if those kids become more active and we do a specific exercise to try to increase the strength of the uh, gastrocnemius and peroneus and tibial anterior muscle that are the ones that are in the back and in the front of the tibial, uh, those are going to help a lot to decrease the side effect of peripheral neuropathy. We also know that the stretchings are a huge thing and also try to work a lot with grasping with their toes and also with the fingers, stretching also all the muscles in our hands all the time, trying to ask kids to do different coordination and do also balance exercise. We know that the sensation is altered by peripheral neuropathy. So the first thing that the kids uh, might lose is the sensation of where they have their fingers. So, and where their toes are positioned because they lost that proprioception. So there is a lot that you can do working in unbalanced surfaces, starting with like a very wide supporting base, kind of open legs and slowly start to decrease the base of sustentation. And finally, if you feel that the kid is getting better, you can also try to encourage them to close their eyes. If they close their eyes, they're gonna be, um, they're gonna be forced to work a lot more with the proprioception, with the sensation of their feet, to see where they are uh, and with, at that state and how they can recover their balance if they lost their balance. So we know that balance is uh, a combination of a visual impact, a vestibular uh, impact and also like a sensation, a proprioception. So sometimes we try to avoid the visual uh, input so then the kid can improve the vestibular and also the proprioception. But if you're going to do that, it has to be very progressive and done in a very safe way. Try to avoid like any hard surfaces around. So if they fall, they might not have like any issues. So as I say before, uh, here we have like uh, images of the muscles that I really highly recommend to stretch and also strength. Um, and also, as we reviewed before, to imbalance exercise and also increase um, the core muscles. Seeing that we have to practice with cautious is uh, any strength training that requires hand grip because the hand grip might be uh, altered because of peripheral neuropathy. So let's say that we are asking the kids Let's say that we're asking the teenagers or even like school age kids to hold a dumbbell. That might not be the most appropriate type of exercise because their proprioception and their grip strength might be affected by the peripheral neuropathy and might be really dangerous. So I will recommend you always use like chair bands that they're not like uh, risk as the dumbbells. Also, we have to be a bit careful about the uneven surfaces, and that is because of the lack of proprioception. But as I say before, if we do it in a progressive way, we can totally go to do that. And also another thing that we have to be aware of is if we are doing exercise and we really want to improve the cardiovascular system, sometimes, if our child is affected by peripheral neuropathy in their ankles, if we ask him to go for a walk or a run, what might happen is their ankles might become tired before we challenge the cardiovascular system. So I will recommend also to encourage them to go for a bike ride instead of going for a run or for a walk, because that might challenge their cardiovascular system more than their ankle strength and flexibility. So just another um, question there. Do we so have any questions in regards to, is it regards to Carmel? The yes, if your child is like playing soccer, they are more than welcome to keep playing soccer, but what might happen is they might be um, less aware of where the ball is, how they move the ball or control the ball with their feet because of the lack of proprioception and lack of sensation in their feet. Also, <clears throat> what happened in soccer is they are encouraged to run a lot and their ankles might become tired before they really challenge their cardiovascular system. 
I know if that answers your question, but I will, if it's something that your child really loves to do, I would encourage him to keep playing that because it's nothing wrong with that. And he's still like doing exercise, doing running, doing a lot of proprioception, you know, trying to coordinate and move the balls. A lot of exercise that I do with my kids at the program is exactly that. You know, we do like a lot of tap, uh, soccer ball. We try to do like eight with the soccer ball because that is a lot of coordination and also balance stuff. And they don't realize that they're doing like a balance or coordination or proprioception. They're just playing with the ball around and they're doing so much exercise. I usually also like um, grab a ball and try to slide the ball from the leg back and forth. So that promote like a stretching, but at the same time, it's a lot of proprioception while the ball is stimulating the muscles. Uh, it's not a fun factor to exercise or sport to keep up with his sister and cousins. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, and that's it. You know, like kids are really motivated to be with their peers. Uh, if they have like older brothers or sisters, they usually want to do whatever they're doing. So whatever motivates them to move, keep doing that. Because this is a key factor, to be honest. It's one of the main things try to motivate them. Sometimes they're like very tired and they feel really bad and they feel sometimes that they can't keep up with their peers or they don't want to do anything. So whatever motivate them, try to go from there and then try to expand their options. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we cover everything here. These are some of the stretches that you can do for the gastrocemius and they're very simple. You can stand up in a step and try to move your heels down. You can do here against the wall, try to keep your foot plant in the ground and bend the front uh, knee to stretch all the gastrocemius and ankle. Achilles or sometimes they might need some assistance and you can put like your little one in the bed hold it from the knee so they're not going to bend the knee and try to push the planter. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, the other thing is fatigue. As I mentioned before, fatigue is also like a huge uh, side effect, a very common side effect. But it's uh, also, I would say like it's, yeah, I would also say like because of fatigue, the kids become very sedentary. So it's kind of a double, double role. So we know that inactivity, just the fact that being sedentary and inactive, uh, if you're laying on the bed, in the hospital bed for a long time without moving around or if you're at home all day long just sitting in the couch watching tv or playing video games what happened is our muscles just atrophy so we lost our muscles we lost like also like the type of fibers that are more like faster because we are not using it them enough um, we also decrease the capillarization like all the muscles all the um, small tiny blood vessels that irrigate our muscles and make them to be more uh, resistant to become fatigued. We also lost those capillarization. We also lost the mitochondrial density that is kind of a tiny uh, organellus that is in our cells that promote the oxygen exchange in our muscles. And we also decrease all the oxidative enzymes that promote uh, muscle contraction. We also know that treatment and chemo and radio decrease bone marrow uh, function. So we know that kids are more fatigued because they're commonly anemic and they don't have the same capacity to transport oxygen in our cells. Uh, we also know that some chemotherapy, agent and radiotherapy decrease uh, the capacity of our heart and become more harder and the same with our lungs. So we also know that all these the inactivity side effect and also the treatment side effect promote a muscular metabolic alteration. So basically our muscles become altered uh, due to all these things that are happening at that time. At the same time, it's not just something that 
happen physiologically in our bodies is also something that happened at our brain level. We know that chemotherapy um, kills cells that are cancer cells, but also healthy cells. And we also know that the cytokines that are secreted and the inflammatory uh, environment that is promoted alter the perception in our brain about the effort and made us to be more tired. Like our body is trying to fight uh, against uh, the cancer cells, but also trying to fight against the inflammation process that is developed because of the treatment. So we don't really have a 100% understanding of fatigue in cancer right now. We have different um, hypotheses and some of them were tested in animals, some of them are seen in human, but it seems to change, depends on the person and the treatment. Um, but what we know is a multifactorial process, so we have to we have to change different things. Something that we learn from an exercise perspective is exercise is able to break the vicious cycle of inactivity and fatigue. So basically we have, uh, if we receive chemo and we become more deconditioning, we want to rest more and exercise less and become more inactive. And this is kind of a vicious cycle in which our Physiological, um, uh, physiological muscles and cardiovascular systems start to decrease even more every day. So what we know, if we stop that sedentary behavior and we start to exercising, we are able to recover the muscles that we showed before. We are able to recover the function in our heart and lungs, and that's going to decrease the fatigue. So we highly encourage exercise, even though if your child is feeling really, really fatigued, encourage them to move. I usually have to pray, like parents to bring the kids sometimes, especially when they are on treatment, because they usually call me and say, no, we are not gonna go today. He's very fatigued. He doesn't really want to do anything. I say, just please, just bring it. We're gonna just do stretches. We're gonna adapt everything to him. So trust me, bring him, you're gonna see the difference. And usually most of the time, I would say like 98% of the time, the kids get out of the session with so much energy, so much happy. And parents usually thank me a lot because they realize about like pushing them a little bit, make them a huge difference. Uh, we know that also whenever we are doing exercise, we secretate endorphins. Endorphins are hormones of the good mood. So we know that even like a one session of exercise might, improve, might increase and might improve the mood of the kids. So it's very important to sometimes push them a little bit, not too much that they feel uncomfortable, but just a little bit to just to move and do something that they really want or they really like. And I ensure you that they're gonna feel so much better after that. Um, this is, was an interesting study that just came up uh, two years ago. We have a lot of evidence from adult population that says that patients that exercise during or after treatment are able to live longer than those that become more sedentary. But we never had um, any of those informations in pediatric population. But in 2018, they um, published in the JAMA Research Scientific uh, Review. They published uh, an article in which they realized that the kids that increase their exercise and they do quite of high intensity exercise over a period of eight years, decrease the mortality rate. So this is a good thing. We we are not just improving the um, quality of life of our kids, but we are also trying to extend the expectancy of life. So this, is a, this was a really nice study that was performed a few years ago. And then we also have that exercise um, might improve psychosocial and neurocognitive issues. 
So we know that, especially for kids that are like have brain tumors or also like those that receive some chemotherapy, some intrathecal chemotherapy, might develop some, um, some issues about like working memory or um, cognitive function, processing speed. So what we realized is like exercise might help to, um, to sham the proliferation of cells in the brain, also might improve those cognitive function, working memory and attention. And we know that sometimes attention is a huge uh, issue for kids that are under chemotherapy or radiotherapy. Uh, and we, re we, we realized that was a study that was performed in the sick kids in Toronto here in Canada. And they realized that a short intervention of 16 weeks improve the attention and the working memory of the children that did intervention. They did an intervention, I think 80% uh, was kind of kind of moderate to high intensity aerobic training for eight weeks, if I'm not wrong, I can't remember exactly what eight or 12 weeks right now, but they realized but MRIs that they increased the working memory and the attention. Um, another thing that is important is like some exercise program uh, that were performed realized that increase the self-esteem of the kid. The kids feel more confident after we're able to master some uh, physical activities. They also increase uh, the comfort and resilience. They decrease mental health issues, depression and anxiety. And um, it was uh, really important to promote uh, social uh, belonging for them going to a program in which they can see other kids like them going through the same. And they don't have to explain to anyone if they're bold or if they have a port or if they feel yucky or if they have nauseous. It was a huge thing for them. Being able to be in a place in which they feel comfortable was a huge increase in their quality of life. Uh, I don't know if that, if I don't know what is the age of your kids and if some of you experienced that before, but you, we know that leukemia is one of the most common uh, type of pediatric cancer and usually kids are on treatment most commonly between four and seven years old. Four and seven years old is kind of the age in which most of the kids started to uh, practice different sports. They started to know how to kick a soccer ball or how to bait a baseball. Um, and what happened is the kids that are experiencing cancer, they're kind of deprivated of that. They are not able to sign up for a soccer team or for a baseball team. So they started to fall behind. So when they jump for treatment, they want to come back to the school and the sport activities. And what happened is they feel they don't fit. They feel they don't have the same stamina that their kid, the other kid. They feel that they cannot run as fast as the other kid. They feel that they don't know how to jump, how to kick a ball, how to do like a basketball dribble. Um, so what we try to do also with the exercise programs is trying to give them the opportunity to keep practicing those skills. So when they're done with treatment, they are in a good position to come back to the sport activities in the society. And they don't feel that they fall behind. Uh, this is something that we really encourage at the peer program, the community-based program that we have here in Calgary. We try to give them different tools and break down the mob so they're able to do it and master the skills so that they feel confident to come back to the society and practice with the other kids. Uh, just to round this up, uh, we know from different articles that exercise is good, we didn't find any uh, serious side effect because kids exercising in any phase of the treatment. Most of the study in pediatric population were performed in kids with acutely polyester leukemia, uh, but even in brain tumor, solid tumor, all the studies that were performed, we never found any um, serious side effect from that. And we also have like, a, this is a manuscript that was published by the American Academy of Pediatrics and there is about medical conditions affecting sport participation and I think they mentioned more than 30 different conditions 
and cancer is one of those conditions and they totally recommend exercise as part of the daily uh, activity uh, and it's funny but the only thing that they contraindicate I'm not sure if some of you knows maybe I'm gonna watch the cues and answer they contraindicate two uh, medical conditions do you know what are those medical conditions that they contraindicate to do exercise they say cancer is good cardiovascular diseases are good might be more derived but are good Asthma is good. Anybody has a clue? What are the two things that they contraindicate? Okay, one, two, three. Okay, so basically, <clears throat> the only two conditions that they contraindicate, and it's something that we all might know because that might happen to us, is whenever we have diarrhea or fever because they increase a lot the risk of hip injuries. So basically, uh, with those two conditions, they contraindicate an exercise just to the risk of dehydration and hip. So then we have, um, in Canada and North America, uh, it's very important what is called the American College of Sports Medicine. In Europe, is usually the European College for Medicine. And basically, those are the organizations that kind of take the statement for uh, what kind of exercise is recommended for different chronic diseases. Uh, basically, in that round table, we have like a bunch of different um, clinicians and physicians that came together and they all make a consensus statement about physical activity in cancer patients and basically this is a statement that they perform exercise training is safe during and after cancer treatment and result in improvement of physical function quality of life and cancer related fatigue in several cancer survivor groups the advice is to avoid inactivity even in cancer patients with existing disease or under difficult treatment so it's really clear that contrary of rest, the inquiry has to do as much as we can and feel comfortable with. Every day might be different. One day is you're gonna be, uh, wake up with a lot of energy and you're gonna be able to do a lot. And the next day you're gonna be able just to go for a short walk, if that is enough, or even though just do some stretches. But you are always be able to do a little bit. What's happening in pediatric population with guidelines? We do not have <clears throat> international guideline consensus statement yet, but we are trying to work hard. Um, right now, we just have like some institutional guidelines that work in different parts. We have like a UK guideline, and it's very general, but basically encourage every child with cancer to follow the physical activity recommendation for all kids. Um, we also have some recommendations for kids that, have, uh, that are at risk of cardiotoxicity because of the high dose anthracycline doses that they receive. And this was just a hospital experience. And this is another guideline that we, we have. Um, and then a few years ago, we created the POM manual. POM stands for Pediatric Oncology Exercise Manual. It was an international project in which we have more than 27 researchers around the world from Spain, Portugal, Germany, the Netherlands, US, Australia, and Canada that we come together to write that guideline based on the research evidence. So basically, we assign an uh, area of expertise to each group to write based on the evidence. So what you're going to see, POM, here is the link. You can download POM for free. And what you're going to see is kind of a translation from what we know from research to the community. And we created two different versions. We create a professional version, but also a parent version, a family version. You are able to download whatever version you want to download. Um, and you're going to see that we have in each of the chapters different recommendations for different type of tumors. We have like a soft tissue, 
uh, tumor, if you have like a bone tumor, if you have like a leukemia, or if you have like a brain tumor, what kind of exercise is more recommended, what the evidence says. And we also have like a, another chapter that is kind of recommendation and precautions about different side effects. So as we mentioned before, peripheral neuropathy is a common side effect. And in the poll manual, you're gonna find more information about what we already see tonight. Uh, we also have osteoporosis, osteopenia, osteonecrosis, anemia, neutropenia. There are like a few other common side effects from cancer treatment that show up in the poll manual. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you are able to download that and see. Um, yeah, might be a little bit like, Overwhelming, I don't know if I have it, no, I don't have it with me now. But maybe a little bit overwhelming at the beginning, but I recommend you to just go and look whatever is important and meaningful. If you have a child with leukemia, just go to the leukemia chapter. If you have a child that is experiencing osteoporosis, just go to the osteoporosis area. Don't try to read all over because it doesn't make any sense and there are like so many different things there. But if you just go to whatever is important for you, that's gonna be very helpful for sure. And also it's a good tool uh, to help sometime your kid to come back to school. Sometimes when we have kids that are back to school, uh, there is a study that show that sometimes the physical education teachers are afraid of what they're allowed or not to do. So the poem manual is gonna give them a very good base of understanding of what cancer is, what kind of side effects are, what is a central catheter device, what kind of, um, uh, what kind of precautions you have to take if your child has osteoporosis. So I will recommend that also if you have like a child that is ready to go back to school. Well, maybe not now that we are in the middle of the COVID situation, but hopefully down the road. So these are some of the, in that link that I say to you, the POM manual, these are some of the areas that we are touching base physical activity for kids with hematopoietic stem cells, for leukemia, physical activity, childhood brain cancer, and solid tumors. And we also have some, as you see here, some infographic just to synthesize the most important key factors. Regarding the exercise guidelines, we are now uh, trying to become with a consensus statement. So we really want to have all the people that have more knowledge around the world come together. So um, Dr. Nicole kulos reed that is a professor here in the University of Calgary, she is leading the pro the, this uh, project. She is the kind of the principal investigator. And we are nine researchers around the world that are the core team. So basically we are kind of designing the main areas that we want to study or become a consensus with, within all of us. But we have 140 experts from around the world that are completing different questionnaires to become, uh, to create what is called international exercise consensus statement. So right now we already had a meeting a few months ago and uh, we discussed the main areas. We all become together. We have like a consensus. A consensus was determined for more than 80% of agreement. So we have to have 80% or more than agreement to do like a recommendation about physical activity. And um, basically what we try to encourage, the, the manuscript is not published yet. We just sent to publication right now. But basically what we are trying to encourage is a culture of movement. Instead of a culture of sedentary behavior, we are encouraged a culture of movement. We know that physical activity is a key factor for a healthy development of every child. Doesn't matter. So we know that it's even more important for kids affected by cancer that already have a lot of late effect and side effect because of their cancer and treatment. Uh, so we know that exercise doesn't have any side effect if it's performed in the right way, supervised by the right person. So um, hopefully uh, we're gonna be able to extend a little bit more. Um, I can't expand anymore right now because the manuscript is not published yet, but basically that's what we're trying to create, a culture of movement. Even when you are in the hospital, instead of laying down, trying to get your child to sit in the chair, to do a little sit and stand from the chair, to play with a ball just to increase mobility in their fingers and strength and decrease the probability of peripheral neuropathy. So we know uh, 
that um, sometimes it's easy to say but difficult to do. There are so many barriers to get our kids more. We know from research that kids affected by cancer, and that is not any news for any of us, are more sedentary than their siblings or their healthy peers. So there are some, dif there are different things that contribute to diet. One of the things is like the treatment from the toxicity, the fatigue that they experience, also the age uh, diagnosis, as we mentioned before, they kind of have like a lack of, they have like a phase in their life as it's missing and in, is with most of the kids are introduced to a sport between four and seven years old and they miss at the stage and then they don't know what to do to fit in the exercise group. And there is also like a lack of information and sometimes there is overprotection from physicians and even like families because the kids are fatigued, they don't feel well, so they kind of encourage them to rest to feel better but it's kind of the opposite we need to encourage them to move to try to break that vicious cycle of disease inactivity and sedentary behavior um, so we know that if we don't break that vicious circle what's going to happen is we're going to increase the impact of treatment toxicity we're going to increase the fatigue and we're going to promote further the condition so we really want to encourage the kids to be active as much as they can. And doesn't matter if it's just a little bit, but everything counts. Doesn't have to be all the exercise at one time. Doesn't have to be 60 minutes of exercise every day. Either like a few minutes of exercise might count and you're gonna see that your child is gonna be improving every day. So for that reason, here in Calgary, we create the peer program and the peer program is a community-based program. And it's kind of, we have like three different community programs in Canada. One is a yoga program. Uh, the other is a individualized exercise prescription program that we have at the cities in Toronto. And then we have the peer program that the peer program was the first community-based program developed here. And it's kind of a group exercise session. Um, we started the program in 2012 and it's an evidence-based program. We try to base all our recommendations from the evidence. Uh, was approved by our local hospital. The oncologist approved the model and the, the curriculum of the program. It was approved by the Nurses um, Association here in Canada is also a volunteer based program and that makes a huge difference so basically i'm the only paid position in the program i'm the kind of coordinator and i oversee the program I, i'm in every session but i'm very lucky to say that i have more than 40 volunteers that help to run the program that allow us to have a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention because we are able to provide one volunteer to one kid and that's going to help to individualize the exercise program. I basically kind of train all the volunteers in the program. Most of the volunteers are kinesiology students or from the medical school uh, and they receive uh, 16 hours training before starting working with the kids. Um, and the program is very successful and all the kids get the attention that they need and we are able to run a group exercise program but individualize the exercise to the needs of every child. We also try, uh, we also believe in the family center program. The parents are the goalkeeper of the program. So if we have like a family that is more active, the kids are gonna be more active. So we're trying to include also siblings in the program. Siblings are welcome to join us and that is a, such a quality time for them, which they can play together. And uh, sometimes promote a like, lot of empathy because they can see other siblings and other kids that are going through the same. Um, we also promote uh, parent yoga classes and physical activity classes for parents. So once every two weeks, the parents are welcome to join an exercise class if they want. Um, some of the parents just want to go for a coffee and have that hour for them. And that's totally fine. Other might want to just go outside and socialize and exchange information with other parents. Uh, but we also try to keep parents active so they can experience the benefit of exercise by themselves. And uh, they also become a role model for the kids. Uh, we also do kind of education sessions in the program just to touch, uh, talk about different 
issues could be like exercise or it could be nutrition so it could be uh, neurocognitive side effects and how to increase uh, executive function uh, and that's it and we are in the community we are lucky to run the program in a gymnasium that is in the uh, alberta children's hospital this is our local uh, hospital here and it's very important that all what we do, we do it in a fun way. This is kind of the gymnasium and both of the kids just doing kind of an ability and a strength training. As you can see, they're playing, they don't realize that they're doing any, they don't do like the machines exercise anymore, that was just the research portion. But then we have different options for them. You know, we have scooter, we have physicals. And as you can see, every child is able to do the program at their level and their needs. Uh, here we have Lydia. Lydia has like a brain tumor. Uh, she was visually impaired. As I said before, um, we have a group session. So they um, benefit from the social interaction and they benefit from the friendship that they get in the program and the interaction that they get. But we are also able to work one on one with the kids in their specific needs. So Lydia did warm up with all the kids, they did a bunch of games, but then we separated her for a little bit because she was in a specific area that she needed to train, and then she was back to the group. And Lydia now is 12 years old, and Lydia is doing downhill skating, so she is doing amazing right now. Uh, we try to promote inclusion as much as we can, and we adapt all the exercise to all the abilities. Uh, we always try to offer an alternative option for all the kids. Uh, socialization is a huge part of our program in which the kids become more identified and they become more comfortable and they are like willing to try and to make mistakes because they feel in a comfortable environment and that is how they learn. Belonging and acceptance is a huge part of what we do. Uh, we try to encourage all of them and understand all of them that each of us is different. Each of us has different capacities, different needs, but that doesn't make us different to the rest. We all have the same uh, right and we can do whatever we want. And the only thing that I always try to convince them is if you practice enough, you're going to be able to do it. You cannot do it yet, but you're going to be able to do it if you keep by practicing. And uh, we have kind of a culture of like that, right? It's kind of, you cannot do it yet, but if you keep practicing, you're going to be able to do it. And that is kind of increase a lot the self-esteem and trying to promote feedback and trying to increase their uh, self-esteem is a huge part of what we do too. Friendship. And uh, these are a couple of quotes uh, for parents of the teenager group. I'm just going to let you read those because my accent might disturb you. So just read you. <laughs> uh, but I think they're like kind of very, kind of reflecting all what we are trying to do at the peer program and why physical activity might become so important and might help a lot in the recovery, not just from a physiological perspective, but also from a psychological perspective. Okay, I'll keep moving now. Okay, so now we are done with the peer program. I also want to say kind of a wrap up about like precautions to exercise. And basically, if our kids have like a severe anemia, we are gonna encourage them to do not exercise until they have a transfusion. Uh, if they have fever, we encourage them to do not exercise until fever is resolved. Um, if you have a child that has like any bone metastasis or osteoporosis or low platelet levels, try to avoid all high impact exercise and contact the sport and decrease the risk of folic as much as you can. Um, patients with cardiotoxicity or at high risk to develop cardiotoxicity because they were in a very high dose anthracycline regimen, they have to be monitorized by their oncologists and cardiologists just to be sure that they are okay to do any exercise. 
um, patients that have a depressed immune system should be cautious about the intensity of exercise. So what I usually, what we usually recommend when your child is immunocompromised is try to do exercise at a moderate to low intensity. There's some evidence from research that says that when your child exercises a very high intensity or a, for a very prolonged time, very prolonged time is talking about like more than two hours probably in a row continuously. So when that happens, if the intensity is too high or the period of time is too long, the, we create what is called kind of open window in which our kids are more predisposed to grab like a upper respiratory level infection. So we kind of contraindicate high intensity exercise if your child is immunocompromised. You also have to be cautious about like where they exercise and be sure that everything is clean and safe. Um, and yeah. And the most important thing is that we don't have like a unique receipt for exercise. Exercise must be tailorized to the participant, their needs, and their type of cancer and medication and treatment. So uh, the take home message will be patient survivor of therapy cancer are risk for multiple side effects during treatment and years into adulthood. Also, it is critical to understand the complexity of cancer treatment and the resulting side effects. It is important to note that children currently in treatment and patients and survivors of pediatric cancer are able to engage in exercise safely with minimal risk. So we really encourage you to push your kids a little bit to keep them active. Individualization of exercise is important. A multidisciplinary approach is also key. If you are working with a physiotherapy or occupational therapist, maybe promote that communication between all the team and also with the oncologist for sure is a key factor. Um, family approach is another big thing. So encourage families all together to be more active is a key factor to success. And because we really want to encourage you to be active, I want to also let you a link that is our new peer website. Because of all this COVID situation, we are not able to do in-person program, in-group person programs right now. So we develop like a website in which we have like exercise prescription and exercise ideas for different age group. Uh, the exercise, the website is still under development. We got a grant to improve the website now. So hopefully by November, December, the website will be like totally renew and improve. Uh, but right now, if you are curious about what is in the website, if you're looking for some ideas to do with your kids at home, feel free to visit the website. I just want to click here. So I'm going to show you what we have. But basically the website is divided in three different age group. As you can see here, we have a preschool, school and teens, and they're coming. You should, hopefully the next week we're going to be able to add that information. We're going to have some condition specific. We're going to start with uh, peripheral neuropathy recommendations. Uh, we're going to follow with some osteoporosis uh, recommendation, visual impairment kids recommendation, and hearing impairment kids recommendation to exercise. Um, we have a playlist, and if you, I'm going to click in the preschool group. And in the preschool group, if you go down, scroll down, you're going to have here, we have like a spring scavenger hand, alphabet challenge, and then you have six different weeks of exercise. Week one is the zoo, Calgary Tower, those are very Calgary oriented teams. But these are the new two weeks that we post this week is the beach and dance and music. So the idea is every month or every month and a half, we're going to post two to four different weeks of activities. And in each week, you're going to have three different days of training. You're going to have like a PDF that have different recommendation. We have even sometimes some uh, craft or some experiment activities to do with your kids. And then we have different activities. We have like a warm up, and the warm up is usually the same during the three days of the week. 
Then we have what is called like a central park with three different games that you can try at home with the equipment that you might have at home. It's like island hopping and a cool down. And we have that for three different sessions during the week. Um, the idea is kind of improve a little bit the website and still have like all this text, have, be able to have like short videos. Uh, but we are in the process to develop and we hope that we're going to improve in a few months. So yeah, that's okay. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to stop here. Okay, so that's the website. So if you can go try and then give us some feedback, that would be amazing because we are trying to find different ways to get your families active. Um, that's it, I think. I have like a couple of questions that I, Rebecca sent to me. This is kind of more picture of the peer program. Uh, one of the questions, I'm not sure if the person who asked the question is around, but one of the questions that I received is, what is the pathophysiology of tall walking after being Christine? And basically, we have not like clearly studied that explain the etiology of tall walking in children after cancer treatment, but tall walking is something that is very common and is usually suspected to be part of the peripheral neuropathy affection. So we have different hypotheses about that. Uh, the first hypothesis might be uh, the sedentary behavior that is uh, promoted because of being long-term hospitalized that promote like a limit ankle dose flexion and also decrease the muscle uh, strength in that area. The other could be a result of peripheral neuropathy that affected range of motion of the dorsiflexion area. And the third is like myopathy and atrophy promote because of the treatment and also like the sedentary behavior. Um, but this is kind of what we know. Um, we are going to encourage if you see like your child into walking, try to consult with your T or occupational therapist or physiotherapist just to give you some tips about what to do. But usually also like you can follow some of the recommendations from an exercise perspective to do some stretching, some strengthening and balance stuff. And the other question was any advice to managing fatigue? Uh, and my daughter has dyskeratosis congenita, a uh, degenerative premature aging disorder. She's 10 years old and suffers from fatigue. Um, I don't have so much, uh, I don't have a good understanding of the disease of your daughter, unfortunately, so I cannot provide any specific uh, advice about that. But uh, if we talk about fatigue and your child is able to do exercise, as I said before, as much as she can do, the better. I would recommend to work with a PT and OT that can give you a clear advice about how to manage osteopenia. Uh, but usually we have some common recommendation for osteopenia. Uh, osteopenia is a low density of their bones, but the good thing about the kids is that kids are at a stage in their life in which they can increase the density of their bones. So in adults, if we have an adult with osteopenia, we must probably contraindicate any high intensity or jumping exercise. But in kids that have osteopenia, we usually encourage them to jump just to increase uh, the density of the bone because that jumping increased the impact in the tendon and muscles and made the calcium to the deposit faster in the bones. Um, usually the kids, as we can see here, usually the, the kids at the poverty age between 12 years old, the girls and 14 years old, the boys increase the peak bone density about three times of what they have. So if you're, I will definitely find advice for uh, certified exercise physiology 
or from a physiotherapy about what to do regarding a strength training for your daughter that might help her to increase the peak bone density. Um, at that stage, as I mentioned before, it's a key age in which she can improve a lot the density of her bones. So stopinia might be reversible at that point. So yeah, that's my advice. I hope I answer your question, uh, but if not, you are free to ask me again or send me an email. And that's it. Thank you so much for the time. Uh, I hope I can I give you some tips and ideas to keep you more active and share the benefit of exercise with you. I don't know if somebody has any questions. All good. Um, if anyone watching this at a later date does have any questions, feel free to get in touch with me um, and I can pass those on and um, get a response. But thank you so much, uh, Dr. Carolina, for joining us. Um, we really appreciate that. And um, it was a very informative uh, talk. And um, I think it's good to start this conversation here in New Zealand. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for the opportunity and yeah, I'm open if you have like any question or email me. I'm totally happy to reply to you. Cool. Perfect. Well, Thank you a, so much. Have a good night. Take Thank you so much. Bye-bye <laughs> everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye.